So that's the beauty of franchising is they're going to raise their voice and you need to listen. Franchisees, they what, what I believe in franchisees is they know what their customer that they deal with every day needs. They have the pulse of their customer. I know the big picture better than they do, but they know what their customer needs and we need to give them the tools to be best in their market, best in their neighborhood. Welcome to the Art of Franchise Marketing. Each episode takes a deep dive into the franchise space and explores how the biggest and best brands handle national branding, franchise development, employee recruitment, and localized marketing on a daily basis. This podcast is brought to you by NetServe, a localized digital marketing partner for franchise networks. NetServe's Madeline Park talks shop with franchise executives to discuss what's working, what's not, and answers the question, what else can you be doing to excel at the art of franchise marketing? Hey everyone, welcome to the Art of Franchise Marketing. Today I have John Hewitt, who is the CEO and founder, uh, well, I should say he's a chairman and, and the founder of Liberty Tax and also the CEO of Loyalty Brands. John is going to share his story today with us about how he got started in franchising and then grew Liberty Tax to what it is today, a household name, and really get into some of that development questions that you're, you're all asking yourself and you're all telling yourself, I want thousands of these locations. What does it really take? So John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. So John, let's go right back to the start. Who is John? How did you get into franchising? And also, why tax services? Okay, I've been in, I've been in uh, franchising for 55 years. So let me take you back uh, long before you were thought of. And uh, I was at the University of Buffalo. And my dad wanted to be an entrepreneur. Never had the chance because he had so many children so quickly. Never had the extra money to become self-employed. But finally, when I was in college, he decided it was time. He was a CFO of a public company, and he decided that we should buy an H&R Block franchise. Mm -hmm. So he's called H&R Block. We lived in Hamburg, suburb of Buffalo, and said, we'd like to buy a franchise. And they said, well, as a matter of fact, we're going to open a company store there this year. Why don't you have your son uh, take our tax course? Maybe he could work for us. So I took the tax course and I loved it and a uh, huge blessing and uh, as a child I knew what I wanted to be the rest of my life. And so 12 years later I was running 250 H&R Block locations including 50 of them were franchised. And my dad interceded again. He had bought one of the first Apple computers by mail and he liked that better than the mainframe that was running his public company. He finally convinced me to leave my job. He left his job. And in 1981, we built the first tax software for an Apple computer. No one wanted it, way ahead of its time. Got blessed and I found a company in Virginia Beach, Virginia called Mel Jackson Tax Service. Mel had died. We uh, bought it, merged the two companies. We went public and 15 years later, we, we changed the name to Jackson Hewitt. 15 years later, we sold it for $483 million. So Jackson Hewitt is, I uh, founded Jackson Hewitt, went on to become a billion dollar company. So now I founded a billion dollar company and I made some money and looking around for what to do and I had taken my top four people with me. My not compete didn't cover Canada because Jackson Hewitt had never gone to Canada. And having grown up in Buffalo, I knew the Canadian tax system. Mm -hmm. And so we opened Liberty Tax in Canada. And within three years became a top 100 retail franchise chain. So now I've built one of the top 100 in US and one of the top 100 in Canada. In 2000, when my not compete ended, I came back to the United States and decided to compete again with H&R Block. And now I had to compete against my own name, my own software, my own system, my own people at Jackson Hewitt. And yet, not only did we grow faster than Jackson Hewitt, we grew faster than Jackson Hewitt and, and H&R Block combined. Liberty Tax was one of the top 10 fastest growing franchisors ever. We opened 4,000 offices in 12 years. 
Again, it was a public company, again, worth $500 million. Again, I sold my stock, and now we have we founded Loyalty Brands, which is an umbrella of eight different franchisors. That's my 55-year career in a nutshell. <laughs> Just a small, quaint career. <laughs> I, John, we definitely appreciate everything that you've given to franchising and, and helping make it what it is, especially on the tech side. My first question, just coming up hearing your story is, do you think that your explosive growth, anytime you came up against a competitor, you ended up outselling them by multiples, do you think that was tech driven? Do you think that was marketing driven? Do you think that was you driven? It was, I attribute it to, of course, me. I'm the, there are, in the history of tax preparation, there's been hundreds of people that tried to go national against H&R Block. And I've done, I'm the only person that did it, and I did it twice. It's all, and I'm blessed to, to have the attributes that enable me to do that. But the key is having differentiators mm -hmm. and providing better service than your competitor. Yeah, definitely like that. And so now with loyalty brands, what brands are, you said eight, what brands are under that umbrella? Yeah, we have, starting with, our, we have two premier brands that are growing by leaps and bounds. And the others are gro all growing, but more slowly. The tax division, ATAX, and you mentioned my fast growth. And yes, ATAX is growing faster than H&R Block or Jackson Hewitt or Liberty. But also we have the fastest growing mobile grooming business and it's called zoom and grooming yeah and i've learned to love the pet industry and just mm -hmm. on february 18th we'll have been in that industry for 30 months and we already have well over 100 vans and we're adding an average of about 10 a month and why well, i peaked at both jackson hewitt and liberty adding about 20 locations a month for and we did that for about 25 years so I expect to get up to about 20, 20 locations per month in, by the end of this year. And I love pets industry for a lot of reasons. And, and one is that uh, people have changed. There's le uh, more childless couples and they have, a pet, they have pets instead of children. And even the, the ones that have both, which is most of, the, most of Americans have, have uh, pets, but uh, there are more Americans with with pets than with with children and they did a survey recently with people that have both and they asked what do you like better the pets or the children and two-thirds of them picked the children or i'm sorry the pets <laughs> listen there are days where i for sure right. pick the pets <laughs> so i'm glad they didn't ask them if they like their spouse or their <laughs> pet better because i'm afraid of, i'm afraid of that answer but so I, I and pets is growing by 12 percent. i've been death and taxes it's such a great industry but, but it's plotting, it's a plotting growth. It's grown by, in my career, in my 55 years, taxes only grows about 1% a year. The pen industry is exploding. It's growing by double digits and every aspect. But, and, and another beauty of the mobile grooming, for example, is there's no national name. I don't have to compete against an H&R Block or a McDonald's. I get, we'll be the number one brand name in America by the end of, of 2024. So it's a whole new world. I've been competing with H&R Block since 1982. And my goal was always to have more offices than they did. They had 9,000 when I started in 1969 and they have 9,000 today. I'm sorry, they didn't have 9,000 when I started. They had 9,000 when I left them in 1981. Wow. And, but my two brands, we did get to 10,000 locations. 6,000 at Jackson Hewitt and 4,000 at Liberty. So I did, in one sense, beat out H&R Block. But in, in mobile grooming, we're the dominant, fastest growing player and going to be number one as far as the eye can see. So when it comes to growth, I think there's two things that people are probably thinking now. One is money and one is support. When you're bringing on 20 a month, how do you make sure that those brands are going to be supported? How do you plan for that style of growth? Because I think right now the issue with uh, FSOs or outsourced franchise sales departments is they can provide said growth, but then what? And there's not really been people talking about the then what. So what is your take on that? Because not only I think what the most impressive thing, John, is not that you've 
manage to add all of these units, but they, you added them, they opened, and then they sustained. That's the important part. What are your thoughts on that? Madeline, you hit exactly on the, the toughest thing about growth, about exponential growth. In, in my companies, when I left Liberty Tax, they, I had 500 employees. And to grow from five to 500, you have to make a lot of decisions. And people have asked me that in my career. What's the toughest thing about growing from sm small to huge and growing exponentially? And the toughest thing is just as you said, it, it, what it comes down to is simplistically, you have two things to manage. One is you have your revenue and you have your structure. And the structure is people and equipment and so forth. And the hardest thing to do is to balance those. If you have too many, too much income and not enough structure, then your system collapses for lack of support. Mm -hmm. And if you have too much structure and not enough income, your system goes bankrupt. And so managing those two things decide is ext extremely difficult. You have to decide, not only is it difficult in the sense, you have to decide how many people and how much payroll and infrastructure to add every year in terms of equipment and supplies and research and so forth. But you, most people can't make the transition from a small company. Think of it, when we started, when we started Jackson Hewitt, our revenue was 300,000 a year. And then Jackson Hewitt peaked at 600 million a year. And you, the same people that are CFO and CMO and your CTO, those people that, that are with you that when you start, they're a different type of skill set than the people that manage our large public companies. So not only do you have to know when to hire, you have to know when to change roles when people no longer can manage at the level that you've grown to. Wow, yeah, I think that's some really powerful words there because I think that ideally people want to assume that you, you get to grow with the brand and if you do well, the brand does well, but there is thresholds for people's experience and, and times when you need to make those changes. Um, and then that goes into my next question of how could you afford that growth? And how do you afford growth right now? Because right now I just did a, a big session on this franchise development. It's, it costs a lot of money to get the right owners in and the pipeline full. How do you balance that in your smaller brand brands where you know how to get to the exponential growth, but also you don't really want to go into the red too much to make that happen. And I think a lot of emerging franchisors are listening going, John, how do I balance? I can't, I'm not at the point right now where the franchise fee can completely go to Fran Dev. How do I balance that growth in terms of letting it go a little to operations, but still not, um, still putting gas on the fire? Yeah, I, I always called it, or my first, one of my first CFO, <laughs> back in the 80s, he said it's called the royalty race. Mm -hmm. He had, Econolodge isn't very big anymore, but back in the early 80s, he had been a CFO of Econolodge, and he said, it's the royalty race. You, you have to build your company through investment and through investment of purchasing stock and investors and the, the sale of franchisees until you can get enough royalties to pay the day-to-day -day expenses. And, and he said, you're always in danger until the royalties cover your expenses because you could go bankrupt. And so that is, again, a, a balancing problem. And sometimes you do it on the cheap and you skate. And as a result, your structure and infrastructure is not as high of quality as it might need to be. And sometimes people go out and raise a lot of money and they're, as a result, they lose a big share of their company because they have to sell stock in order to finance the growth. And, and growth is, has, in my case, and if not always, it's very expensive. Yeah. And so what are, where do you fall on the scale or do you think it really matters by brand and industry? Do you, would you say, do it on the cheap and do the grind and the hustle and ideally replace that later when you're royalty sufficient or do you fall on the side of raising capital 
it's case by case, and I have eight different companies, mm -hmm. and I have some do one and some do the other. It depends on the situation, and it depends on the prospects. The What can tell you which direction to go is how fast you're growing. And there are some industries that are just going to be hotter than others. As I mentioned, pets is just exploding. Uh, but there are some industries like roofing or inspection in, in, inspe and others that are just more plotting. And so it takes more time. And so we don't want to we don't want to um, sell a big part of the company until we've uh, developed it out. I like that. Yeah, I think that's some very great advice for our listeners is so many times in franchising as it's follow the leader. So it's what is everyone else doing? And as much as they say my brand is different, my industry is different, they never take that into when they're starting to compare in terms of growth. So a lot of people are saying, Maddie, I can't afford to do have a cost per acquisitions that's 28.5. And when it comes down to you either have to get a partner or give some equity away, or you have to pound the phones, it's an either or. There is no silver bullet that's just gonna, you turn it on, spend a little money and get the best franchisees. I think right now we're in an area where franchisors think it's appropriate to ask for that, and it's simply not. So what other brands do you have under loyalty? Because you have now you have a tax and what are mm -hmm. the other six? Yeah, we have, as I said, we have a, a inspection company called Inspection Boys. Okay. We have loyalty business brokers. Okay. And some people aren't familiar with business brokers, but they buy and sell businesses just like realtors sell houses. Mm -hmm. We have Johnson Staffing. We have, so we have a staffing company that um, is growing well. We have a accounting company. Ledger's Accounting is a accounting company that focuses on more bookkeeping and consulting versus tax preparation that my career has been in tax preparation. Very like accounting, but in my tax preparation companies, less than 5% of the revenue was in accounting services, accounting and payroll. Whereas in Ledger's, it's mostly accounting and payroll and it's higher income taxpayers. So, and then we have Little Medical School. Uh, Little Medical School is a, a feel good, I, I like the feel of it because we take four to 14 year olds and we dress them up in lab coats and give them a stethoscope mm -hmm. and teach them all about medicine. And uh, the, the thing that makes me feel good about that is that I believe we're gonna have more doctors and nurses in this country because of our after school and our summer school little medical school programs. And then finally, our newest one is a roofing and siding and solar company. So those are our eight brands. I just fell in love with little medical school. My daughter, so I have three kids, seven, five, and one, and my daughter who's five is so ready to be a doctor. And I just spent, you know, for someone who already is pretty strapped on time. I think I spent the last 20 hours literally building her a little medical station because there's nothing out there that teaches her outside of these fly-by-night dolls that need a million size D batteries and then they throw it, throw in the trash. So I think that's really great. And my question is though, most of you, your brands are business services. What made you go outside of that to, instead of having just a business service franchise brand, you now have your pet and the little medical uh, and also the roofing and solar. What was the decision behind that to deviate away from all business services to a cross industry one? Yeah, we did not limit ourselves to any one type of franchisor. What, what I'm always looking for is to, in order to have a great partner, a great franchisor to invest in is you have to have a, a system that's replicable. And it, it can't be replicable, only replicable by extraordinarily talented people. Because I brought in 5,200 franchisees in my career. Um, I don't, I'm sure someone else must have brought in 5,200. I don't know any. But me either, John, me either. <laughs> so I've changed, and, and they had hundreds of thousands of employees, so I've changed thousands of lives. And, but when you bring in masses, not everyone is a superstar. Not everyone's like you, Madeline. And people are just, some people are just above average. And you have to have a system that's replicable for 
the for someone that's not a PhD or an MBA or a genius or that's a normal everyday person that just wants to seize the American dream. So it has to be replicable by the masses, if you will, and, and not a below average person, but someone that's just above average. Again, they don't that you don't want some of them. You don't want to have a franchisor that requires you to be a dentist or a doctor or a veterinarian or those. There's few and far between, and the best franchisees are the people that want to seize the American dream and that roll up their sleeves and work extremely hard. So it had to be replicable, and it has to have a differentiator. If in too many of our industries there are there are uh, tons of companies that go out of business. In fact, in this country, half of the franchisors in the country that belong to the International Franchise Association, they do not have uh, more than 20 locations. And that's a failing franchisor. Many or most franchisors fail. And the, the, key, the reason they're failing is uh, twofold, but one is that they don't have a differentiator. If David had gone onto the field with the same sword and the same armor, same shield as Goliath, there would be no David and Goliath story. He'd be the, the 189th guy killed by Goliath. So you have to have differentiators. You have to have things that set you apart that a customer, it's an object, it has to be objective because not, it can't be subjective. If you, because if you ask the H&R Block CEO who offers the best service, he would say H&R Block. If you ask the Jackson Hewitt CEO who offers the best service, he would say Jackson Hewitt, but they don't. And so we have in each industry, we have objective things that we do better than our competitor does. That is an incredible way to put it. Uh, oftentimes brands will say, oh, my differentiator is we have a, nobody uses our colors and people like this color more. And I'm like, that's not, <laughs> that isn't the differentiator. The differentiator is that you also groom cats and not just dogs. The fact is a different, the differentiator has to be objective. John, so now I'm thinking along the lines of your you have a platform of brands and you're growing. Can you talk to me about the what is now the Wild West of PE? It seems like right now that everyone's trying to be a platform brand. And the idea being is that they get to sell to private equity in three to five years after crazy growth for this <coughs> multiple. And then what happens is even if they get to that point and they're able to do that, the franchisees and the brands suffer because then they're never going to get the support they need and infrastructures are failing. And I'm, I'm a victim of a couple of those turnovers. What is your thought there based on everything you've seen in the industry? Because I tell people all the time, I'm not going to, we're not going to beat private equity and private equity can't be necessarily held accountable for not being the best franchisor because they're the numbers people. So where do you see them falling in the future of franchising? Where do I see private equity falling? I, I think that unfortunately, that is the way that most brands go. And you're right, The when the entrepreneur leaves, the, the entrepreneurs like myself, mm -hmm. our goal is long-term. Our goal is to change lives and to have a the best want to have the best system and we have the best system in each industry and I've been doing that for 55 years but in each case we sold the we sold out to the equivalent of private equity at both Jackson Hewitt and and Liberty Tax and and in each case they took my companies down dramatically and it took at uh, Jackson Hewitt was on such a great roll that it took them 15 years to go bankrupt, but they expanded and then went bankrupt, and then under private equity, and then and they went public too. And they the company that hired that bought um, Jackson was almost like private equity. They were the public company, a big public company called Sendit, that had 35 different franchisors. So they were one of the first platform organizations, and they had a great organization. They had a great number of stable of brands. They had Avis, they had Century 21, they had Caldwell Banker, they had Jackson Hewitt, and and yet 
they mismanaged all of those. Then we sold Liberty in 2018 to a, to, to a handful of private equity firms, and they went bankrupt last year. The, when I left Liberty, there were 4,000 locations. Today, there are only 2,200 locations. Private equity is, you're right, they deal in numbers and they don't deal in people. The key reason there are for difference between great franchisors and ordinary franchisors, or even worse, is very simple, Madeline. And you would think that everyone would get this. It's so obvious, but they don't. And what I've learned and what I've lived is happy, successful franchise fees. It's mm -hmm. that simple. If you have happy, successful franchisee, you expand, you give referrals, you're excited, and the brand prospers. If the franchisees are not happy or successful, you have to be both. Then, because some franchisees, believe it or not, they're happy without being successful because they just love what they do. But you have to be happy and you have to, when I, de, I define success as a fair return on investment for the time and the money that you've invested. If you have half of, but what happens too often with private equity, since they're so numbers driven, they don't understand that, that franchisees are people and they're not machines. You can't push a button and get franchisees to do anything. You they have to be happy and, and successful. And so I'm not a fan of, of private equity. And um, the, what we look to do is to have uh, owners that are committed to franchisee success. And if knowing what you've known, you basically left two of your babies and in essence, they, they went bankrupt after you left them in the hands of, let's say a bad babysitter. Are there any tips you can give to franchisees that are still looking at private equity that can help them maybe protect their brands from the, I don't want to say the bad buyers, but the number buyers? Just don't. It, it happens virtually every time. Again, uh, I don't want to besmirge, say too much bad about private equity. They write big checks, and but they're, what happened when each of the companies I started, we took venture capital at the beginning, and what happens when you start, and, and as they, they were minority owners, mm -hmm. and when you start the first year, we're both looking ahead five years or five to seven years. But as you approach five to seven years, they're thinking to get out and you're thinking, you're keeping thinking five, seven, 10 years ahead. Mm -hmm. So your goals uh, diverge after a few years because they're thinking exit. And exit means to them at the highest price, which means to maximize current profitability versus future profitability. Mm -hmm. And as, a, as an extraordinary entrepreneur, you're always thinking, how do I build the greatest company with the greatest long-term value? And the, and there's a change of focus for s certain investors. And I'm, I would never uh, say that's every venture capital or every private equity, mm -hmm. but that's what you have to watch out for is that, that the divergence of goals, that your goals are gonna be different eventually than your investors. And so you have to account for that in the way that you treat them and the way that you organize the agreement. What I learned that one of the biggest mistakes I made at uh, Jackson Hewitt was that I didn't have controlling stock. And so at both Liberty Tax and Loyalty Brands, I have controlling stock. So they don't get to, they don't get to win in, in uh, an argument. I get to, and they have to make that choice whether they invest, when they invest in me. Do I, am I willing to invest in someone that that has controlling stock. And because of my success, I've earned that. I've yeah. earned that ability. Yeah, no, I, I think that's completely fair. And, and I like the way that you put it in terms of, sometimes people do need to bring on capital, but does it have to be majority? And that's the risk that you're, you're gonna put your franchisees and yourself and your brand up against. And we love the story of, I think people love the story of the big check, the big private equity. But I think that they forget mm -hmm about the long game. As they're building, and I've asked probably 
10 of the top CDOs and CGOs in the industry right now, do you have a formula for how many location, locations you should bring on? Do you have a formula for when you have enough locations that you are able to go the buyout route? Do you have any philosophies behind those types of hard numbers? How many locations should I open a year? How many locations is enough? How many is not enough? Fortunately, in, in uh, most of my career, in the first 50 years of my career, I was going against uh, H&R Block. Mm -hmm. And if H&R Block, there was, the, when I started franchising, there was 9,000 H&R Blocks, mm -hmm. and there are 9,000 today. So the way we decided how many locations we wanted was how many H&R Blocks there are. If H&R Block didn't exist, if we were the leaders in the industry, then we would have to make a decision of how big we can get to be. So it was easy for me the, the first 50 years with um, our new brands that we have to do some uh, demographics and make some decisions. And so we, and one thing you look at when you, when you build the brand is you look at your competitors. W what is the size of their territory? And, and pretend there's 360,000 people or 360 million people in the United States mm -hmm. and you decide that you need 360,000 for to create a viable territory then that means you're going to have a thousand offices or a thousand locations if if you only need 60,000 then that means you can have 60,000 or 6,000 offices so you have to decide what is the minimum size of a territory so that you can have happy successful franchisees and we're learning on the fly right and we're learning with our own experience so what i do in my brands is i start out giving more i i have an end and uh, belief that this is the right number of people in a territory and with zoom and grimman for example i believe that it was somewhere between 90 and 110,000 people was the right size of a territory. But in the first two and a half years, we have uh, given territories of 150,000 people. And now we've learned that by watching them put in their, their second van inside a territory and their third van and so forth, and as they acquire territories, we've learned that we're dropping the, the size of the territory this year from 150 down to 125 to 135. So we're moving in the direction that I projected, but we're basing it on uh, what is satisfactory to have happy, successful franchisees. I really appreciate that advice because nobody until this time has given that to me because they've all said, it depends on the brand, it depends on the minimum investment, it depends on your support staff, and it, it does, and I understand that, but there has to be overarching goals and understanding of how big we can be and, and quite frankly, what is enough and what's not enough. Do you think that there's times or certain brands where in franchising, the idea is you grow, but do you think that there are brands that plateau, like they they shouldn't grow to more locations, they shouldn't go international? They shouldn't go to registration states. Do you think there's limits on those brands and franchising or particular brands and franchising? Well, I'm a very fierce competitor with very high standards. Yes. In the International Franchise Association, I believe there's 4,000 different chains, mm -hmm. 4,000 different franchisors. As I said earlier, half of them are have 20 or less locations. Mm -hmm. And to be in the top 10% 10, 10 of the 4,000, in the top 400, and I don't recall the number off the top of my head, but it seemed like it's only three or 400 locations. They, they, whether they should plateau or not, they do plateau. If I love the January issue of Entrepreneur Magazine because it has the franchise 500 mm -hmm. and it lists about 800 different franchisors and it tells how many locations they had two years or three years ago, two years last year, two years last year and, and this year. And so you can see whether they're growing or not. And I have very high standards and most franchisors do not meet my standards for growth. And the, uh, I'm not a fan of most of them. They're, uh, but the proof is in the pudding. If they yeah. have 
happy, successful franchisees, then I'm a, I'm a believer. So do you think on that, do you think that every brand should do a franchisee satisfaction survey, things that FBR do to make sure that they keep a pulse? Or do you think that franchise culture and, and understanding that you have happy franchisees and franchisees that feel supported should just come naturally? It, the beauty of franchising is one of the one of the great things about franchising is that they always complain, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> they're bolder, they're bolder than employees, mm -hmm. and it's to have the greatest system, which is my fanatical obsessive goal. You have to be improving, and what we do is something that almost no franchise franchise or does. In fact, we, I started this at Jackson Hewitt back 35 years ago. And what at our convention, we break into groups of, we divide into groups and we say, we have marketing, we have training, we have support, technical support in tax, it was tax support. We have technology. We have, we broke into about 10 or 12 different groups and say, tell us to how to improve. And we wrote every idea down. No matter how stupid, right? It could be paint every office blue, paint every office black, or who who cares? But we wrote every idea down. And then afterwards, we sit with my executive team and members of the franchise community and said, which of these are we gonna train change this year? In the next twelve months? What are we gonna change after that? And what are we never gonna change? And I'm proud to say that after doing this thirty five years they most changes are implemented that year and franchisees are it's so hard to it's so hard to improve if no one tells you you're screwing up you need to embrace criticism yeah and my and i tell my people that in some only a few of my people can do that having had 5200 franchisees i'm one of the most criticized person on the planet mm -hmm. right and most and but it's i'm i'm fanatically committed to improve and it's so much easier if people say, these are all the things that are wrong. It's so much harder if you're sitting in by yourself and no one's complaining. And so that's the beauty of franchising and that you need to listen to your franchise. You know what happened at, <coughs> I'll tell you one thing that, that I happened at both Jackson Hewitt and Liberty when I left, mm -hmm. they changed the convention to a normal convention. That the CEO came in, he knew nothing about the tax mm -hmm. industry. Both of the people that took my place knew nothing about the tax industry. And they said, we need to explain, we need to lecture to franchisees. We need to be the, the answer machine. We need to lecture. So they canceled all listening to franchisees. They didn't know one tenth of what I knew, one thousandth of what I knew about this industry. And I'm willing to listen and love to listen and but they weren't they didn't care to hear from the franchisees in fact they discouraged it so that's the beauty of franchising is they're going to raise their voice and you need to listen franchisees they what, what i believe in franchisees is they know what their customer that they deal with every day needs they have the pulse of their customer i know the big picture better than they do but they know what their customer needs and we need to give them the tools to be best in their market, best in their neighborhood. I love that. I love the essence of, and I'm guilty of it too. No one likes criticism, but at the end of the day, if you're going to continue growing and keep your franchisees happy, you have to know what you're doing wrong. And why guess at that? Why not just have someone tell you? And then of course you can decide what to listen to and what not. But if you don't know, and you just think you're great, the tower will fall. My friend, the tower will fall. If you, if you think, if you don't know that, that there are problems, you're an idiot. So my, we're coming up on time, but like I said, like this was one of the most informative, best straight to the point podcast. So we certainly will, for our listeners, have John do a series on this. But before we end, maybe we can end each of our episodes like this. What is one of your favorite stories in franchising? Doesn't have to be the favorite, but just a favorite. I've changed, I've created a thousand millionaires. And I just have so many great stories that I'll tell you that one of the things we learned, this is how we learn to call customers. We call customers instead of sending an email or sending or handing them a postcard to, to evaluate us. 
we evaluate our customers and and there's a lot of reasons to do that and we don't have enough time to explore that right now but the way i invented that is in 1995 or 94 95 two of our franchisees raised their fees dramatically and they because they were way under charge and they're both in chicago and i ran it one was head of the national advisory council and i ran into him and he said i said to him kukler next door he raised his fees more than you did and he did he had a bigger growth percentage than you did in number of tax returns and he said oh he'll suffer next year so i bet him a dollar i only bet a dollar at a time not five or ten or a million or a hundred <laughs> but i bet him a dollar on that and i said let's get a franchisee a neutral franchisee to call a hundred of each of your customers of, and see who's more satisfied. And so I got a lady named Josie or Glebowitz, and I had her call a hundred of each. Mm -hmm. And I turned out I won my dollar bet. Maybe that's why we do it. But she liked the res, the customers were so gratified to be called and asked how we did for them that she called all of her customers. And so we've been doing something that almost no one in any industry does. We call all, all of our customers. And so I learned that from that that one one dollar bet thirty years ago. <laughs> well, John, that's an incredible story, and I also like the idea of betting a dollar and just winning the dollar because at the end of the day, it's not about the size of your budgets, the size of your brand, your the size of your check. What matters is the passion and the care that you put into each and every one of the people that you're working with. And I think that's what makes you, your brands and franchising overall so successful. So on behalf of franchising, John, thank you so much for everything you've done. And we look forward to talking to you on our next John Hewitt series, which we'll probably record in the next week or two. <laughs> thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Art of Franchise Marketing. This show is brought to you by NetSerted. We help franchise brands and multi-location businesses run localized digital marketing at scale. To learn more, visit netsertive.com.